Hi everyone, today we're going to be talking about the heating and the cooling in the interstellar medium. This is the last chapter on the ISM. This is another one of the kind of case studies that we want to explore here. And it, it, it illustrates the sort of final important point of the ISM, which is how the ISM uh, turns thermal energy into radiation as a kind of process uh, for heating. So it takes out uh, energy from stars, uh, turns it into line radiation, and ends up cooling off. Uh, and cooling processes are really important for forming cold clouds, driving the star formation process, etc. So it's going to be a fairly high level perspective because we're going to have to sweep a lot of deep and exciting quantum physics under the rug uh, that is, I'd say, pretty tedious. Awesome, but tedious. Anyways, uh, so the thing that I want to recall from H2 regions is H2 regions were being heated up by photoionization. If a 30 electron volt uh, photon comes in and ionizes a uh, photon, there is going to be 16.6 electron volts of kinetic energy carried by the electron after it gets ripped off the hydrogen atom. And what this means is that goes into the gas uh, collides with other electrons and ends up heating it up. The recombination process will do some cooling as we release Balmer series photons and uh, uh, the, the higher so passion and fund. Uh, those photons end up leaving the nebula and they end up taking away radiation with them and so that ends up cooling them off. But H2 regions also cool through what are called the nebular emission lines. And even though they are less abundant, uh, things like carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen are really important for cooling off H2 regions and bringing their temperatures down. And so uh, what we see here on the x-axis is the radiation uh, in a galaxy. Uh, the orange curve is showing you what happens when there is no nebular gas uh, coming off. And then all of these spectral lines that we see here, those lines, uh, this bright one up here is the H-alpha line, those lines are the radiation sort of being converted from stars into optical line photons through the transitions inside of um, uh, multi-electron atoms. Uh, I'll remind you that we are going to be operating with spectroscopic notation here. So when I say that I have brackets O3, that's referring to an oxygen uh, atom that has been twice ionized, so doubly ionized oxygen. O2 is a single ionization stage. And the general process for cooling is that an electron is running around in the plasma and it hits one of these atoms. Uh, it doesn't recombine, but it undergoes a collision where it excites an internal degree of freedom, which basically means it knocks one of the multi-electron electrons up to a higher energy state and then proceeds on its way. And in doing so, it loses some energy. So in this process, the uh, electron comes in and it loses some energy. So E drops for the electron and E inside increases for the uh, oxygen. And that's why we give it this little asterisk down there. It just means it's an excited oxygen atom. But excited oxygen atoms don't stay excited for long and they undergo an electronic transition and then they drop it down uh, from the excited state to no excited state, and they leave a photon running around. Now those uh, oxygen atoms, uh, these show the two states of oxygen. Here's O2 and O3. And this shows all of the different uh, transitions within them. And the neat thing about this is that there's lots of degrees of freedom in uh, these. These are not the only electronic states, but these are the ones that are most readily excited by collisions with electrons in the ISS. Yeah. And so this shows that these are optical photons that are being kind of coupled out, 500, 496, 372. That's getting a little ultraviolet. These are definitely ultraviolet. That's a nice red photon up there. So all these photons uh, end up leaving the nebula uh, and carrying away energy as they get excited. So they're easy to excite, they de-excite, and they carry away energy. 
So the way we deal with this isn't to worry about the quantum mechanics of oxygen or carbon or nitrogen or any of the other species in the gas. What we do is we just write it down and we kind of sweep all of the, uh, the quantum under the rug and we say we know how this has to behave. And we write down what is a cooling rate. And the cooling rate is, this is important, is defined as the power radiated per unit volume. Uh, and basically we sweep everything messy into this constant big lambda that is appropriate for an oxygen atom. Now what's neat about this is that the, this is the power radiated per unit volume, so that's watts per cubic meter or joules per second law, uh, joules loss per second per cubic meter. And it's a product of two densities. Basically you say that if there are more electrons, there's going to be more of these collisions uh, that run around. And if there's more oxygen atoms, there's going to be more of these targets to hit. And so the cooling rate must depend on the density of the electrons and the density of the oxygen atoms together. So the product of those and whatever this cooling rate is gives us the total cooling rate of uh, this per unit volume. Now, the general process uh, for this cooling rate, lambda sub O, has a form of the amount of energy carried away uh, times the reaction rate, which is the cross-section for this interaction happening in the same sense of like probability of interacting, uh, times the speed with which those electrons are coming in. And we are uh, have these angle brackets to say that we're going to average over all of the speeds that things can be coming in from different temperatures, all of the different ways that the oxygen atom can be hit. We're just going to sweep that under the rug and everything. And in fact, we're going to turn this whole thing lambda zero into just a number. We don't want to actually know too much about it, but we should know roughly how it behaves. So first, since this is a two-body collision, that implies this dependency on the density of things squared. Uh, so the density of electrons times the density of the oxygen goes like the density of the matter squared if the abundances of electrons and oxygen are the same. Now, this cross-section is some nasty business. Uh, I've written down, I've expanded this a little bit into even more equations, which you definitely don't need to know, but understand that there's some quantum mechanics running around here. There's uh, collision strengths. We have a uh, Boltzmann factor. We have the occupation number as the temperature increases. It spreads out the electron uh, in velocity space. There's a bunch of physical constants in the form C. And if you look at the collision strength, they have all these resonant features where you're coming in at just the right kind of angular momentum to excite the oxygen atom and make a connection from, say, the 3p to the 1s state has these resonant spikes in terms of the energy of things. So it gives us a lot to worry about. And we just say, thank you very much. Um, Donald Osterbrock and all the other people who calculate it to reduce this to just single numbers with te known temperature scaling. So we're going to get engineering fitting formulas out of this. And uh, we're going to basically push all of this and all of the species into a single cooling rate that describes the interstellar medium times the product of the density. Now, because of that dependence in the, um, uh, the the dependence in the quantum mechanics of this and the statistical mechanics of it, there is some significant temperature dependence to this, and that's sort of illustrated here, where this is the cooling rate lambda, and I've drawn those in the blue lines as a function of temperature. This function actually increases as the temperature goes up. And so all these cooling lines go up and their different slopes vary with the different species that we uh, have going on. We don't care about that. We're going to add them all up and give you a total cooling line. But I do want to highlight this so you understand why does this have the shape? Why is it more likely to happen as it gets hotter? It basically means that it's more likely for the collisions to occur in triggering the cooling and allowing things to happen. Uh, and leave the radiation. So that gives us an explanation for the lambda here.
And so this adds up the cooling from the different species uh, as we go up, and I just want to call that out for the total cooling. And uh, the other thing to note is the typical values is this is sort of 10 to the 36, 10 to the 37, 10 to the 38, and it has units of watts meter cubed. And so that's, uh, I think, the key thing to actually uh, know is that it's watt meter cubed uh, in the unit. So if I multiply it by two powers of density, I get watts per cubic meter. Okay, that's cooling. How does the ISM get hot? Well, the ISM gets hot mostly from um, photoionization. So high energy radiation comes in, it gets processed by the ISM into cool, uh, cooling radiation, which is lower energy and lower wavelength. So what this means is that we can actually convert, uh, we can actually compute uh, the energy that comes from uh, photoionizations, which is essentially uh, we care about the energy uh, of a photon coming in minus the ionization energy uh, below. So this is sort of your trusty hydrogen atom getting ionized up. And this gap here in this equation, that would be E naught. That's the ionization potential of the atom. And so this difference here is H nu minus E naught. If this is the, the speed of the kinetic energy is going to be one half mv squared uh, for the kinetic energy in the photon. So this is essentially how much energy gets deposited in every photo ionization. And then this is the amount of energy, the number of photons that are coming out, hitting the hydrogens, and this uh, C is converting it into basically the size of the volume uh, that uh, it happens uh, that the uh, photons are sort of sweeping through. Uh, so this gives us a heating rate. And the important thing that I want you to note about all of this is that the key parameters, much like the big lambda in the previous uh, slide, they have just, uh, they all get swept into this big value gamma, and then NH is the hydrogen density. And this only, it depends on the strength of the radiation field, uh, in space, and then the only thing it depends on is the density of the hydrogen atoms. So this N times the cross-section times C, that's basically uh, the reaction rate for uh, part uh, for gas uh, to be photoionized. Okay, uh, so this is the field combined with one set of targets where the field is the radiation sweeping out, so it only has one power of density in it. It's gamma times NH, whereas lambda had two powers of density tied to it. And they both give us a heat, this is a heating rate in units of watts per meter cubed. And so what happens here is we get a balance between the heating and the cooling. And under certain conditions, we sort of have this equilibrium point where the heating rate equals the cooling rate and that gives us the uh, thermodynamic equilibrium point of the ISM. And if there's more cooling than heating, the temperature drops, and then vice versa, the temperature rises up until they're at this crossover point, uh, depending on the density here. And so that sets a thermal equilibrium. Okay. Um, so I just want to give a couple uh, expressions here. Uh, so for example, the uh, full on uh, model for uh, uh, the, well, let's consider the atomic interstellar medium here. And in that case, uh, we want to sort of figure out what the temperatures uh, of the interstellar medium could be in this region. Uh, and so we're uh, going to be sort of similar to the uh, photo uh, ionized regions, the H2 regions, but there's some different processes at work. Uh, instead of uh, it being photoionization of hydrogen atoms, we're going to use a similar heating rate here, but the thing we're talking about is actually the dust grains. And so an individual dust grain gets hit by a photon that comes in and it's lower energy, it's usually in the optical, and that will kick off an electron. And that electron will carry with it some kinetic energy. So this carries Ke, and that gives us heating. And perhaps not surprisingly, this is very similar uh, to something like the uh, H2 region, where the heating is not the ionization potential, but it's basically the photoelectric potential for this dust grain. 
simpler expression here. In the neutral ISM, the cooling is set by carbon and oxygen, and uh, these have some very famous spectral lines that they're undergoing cooling from. And the cooling rate for carbon is 10 to the minus 40, and then this dependence on temperature uh, that we kind of expect from uh, the previous. And so lambda NA squared is this value. So what is neat is if we can take these heating and these uh, cooling rates and figure out the possible temperatures of the interstellar medium. And the thing that I want to sort of point out is that if we work this out, we actually get to the idea of a two-phase interstellar medium uh, from the structure, the basically the functional forms of these heating and these cooling rates. And so this is a little bit of a complicated diagram that I kind of want to work through here in some details here. Uh, this is the temperature of the gas in Kelvin. And for some reason, I've got the density of the gas in um, uh, meter cubed uh, showing along the bottom axis. And, oh, sorry, nope, that is the pressure of the gas. Uh, See, this is why you always have units coming in here. So this is pressure defined uh, over the Boltzmann constant in units of, uh, it's basically the product of the temperature times the density. And so this is an interesting point here because as about the equilibrium pressures inside the interstellar medium, uh, we get that the equilibrium curve traces out this kind of S-shaped and that's from tabulating these two functions as a function of temperature and pressure. And traces out this nice little uh, uh, S-shaped uh, value here. And uh, that S-shape is peculiar because if I have some gas out here in uh, this regime here, what's going to happen is that it's going to have a um, heat cooling rate that's larger than its heating rate. And so it's going to go ahead and move down and land on a stable locus where it comes to an equilibrium. But if the heating rate is larger than the cooling rate, it's going to move up and hit the locus where it, everything is equal. And so uh, this is kind of interesting because if I push something upward, uh, in this uh, sort of curve here. What that does is it perturbs it into the state where the cooling is larger than the heating, and so it's gonna come right back down. So it's a stable curve. And similarly, if gas is on this equilibrium, and if I perturb it, it's gonna go up, it'll go into a regime where the heating, it's gonna cool down, make it uh, for whatever reason, and it's gonna turn around, and it's gonna loop back and kind of hit uh, this because the heating is larger than the cooling. So it's going to get down here. It's colder than it should be. Heating will kick in and raise it back up. Similarly, up top here, we have a uh, state where if I push uh, it upward, it'll uh, come back down, uh, so it increases temperature. And then if I push this one uh, up to in here, the heating will it'll cool down, but the heating will kind of push it back uh, to this equilibrium state. That's all well and good, uh, but of course what I've sort of neglected to mention is what happens here where this S-curve kind of comes back. And what happens is if I take it off here, this gas off here, and I push it down into this regime where the cooling is larger than the heating, what's going to happen is that this gas is going to uh, keep getting colder. And so it's actually going to fall down all the way and land on this next locus down here where the cold neutral medium is formed. And similarly, if I have gas and I make it a little hotter than it should be from the equilibrium, it pushes up here into the regime where heating is more important. It's going to keep rising up until it hits this point uh, where the temperature, uh, or sorry, where it comes into equilibrium again. So stuff along this sort of backwards curve here, that's unstable. And so the material in the ISM tends to gather here along these two curves where we have the cold gas down here at temperatures less than about a thousand kelvin and then we have warm gas where the temperatures are up near about 10,000 kelvin so it's kind of cool how we have this temperature structure in the ism that makes cold clouds and warm clouds 
but nothing much in the middle. And that's just a byproduct of the heating and cooling. And so what this shows you is a bit about how the quantum mechanics of the heating and cooling processes lead to kind of a separation into these two phases of the ISM and naturally have stuff kind of form into these cold clouds. Because if we cool to a certain point, that cooling is unstable and we end up going really cold and ultimately into this high pressure, low temperature uh, phase where it can convert to molecular gas and ultimately form stars. Okay, uh, in general, we will be working with heating and cooling curves for the ISM that look a little something like this. Uh, these have kind of characteristic shapes to them. Uh, we'll always give you kind of tabulated versions of them. And then if you're going to use them, you can go ahead and figure out, oh, okay, so if I'm at 10,000, let's see here. 1000 Kelvin, I can read off and get the, um, I can get the um, uh, cooling rate or the heating rate just by reading it off uh, the, uh, it, reading it off over here. Uh, okay, uh, so I want to just close out by giving you an example uh, by asking, what is the time for some part of the unstable neutral medium uh, to, uh, with a cooling rate of 3 times 10 to the minus 37 watts per cubic meter. So that's about what you would get out 1,000 Kelvin. We read up, and it's about 3 times 10 to the 37, and that's appropriate for something here in the unstable neutral medium. I'd like to understand how long will it take to cool from the temperature of 1,000 Kelvin down to not much at all. And so the way we do this is using a characteristic cooling time scale, T cooling, which is equal to the amount of thermal energy that it has. That's the thermal energy. And we're going to divide it by the cooling rate. And that cooling rate is the lambda times the N h squared. So this is basically the thermal energy per unit volume, and then we're going to divide it by the power of radiation per unit volume. And the thermal energy per unit volume is going to be 3 halves kT, which is the thermal energy per particle at temperature T, and then per unit volume, I just multiply by the number of particles per unit volume. So it's 3 halves nKT, which is basically the energy density from thermal motion. Then in the denominator, I have lambda, which I already calculated, and nH squared. So this is basically, again, a kind of how far it has to cool. That's the thermal energy. And then the speed with which it is cooling, that's the denominator. So it's a D over V kind of argument, distance over speed uh, in some sense uh, for how it's going. All right, so we're going to uh, go ahead and calculate this now. Uh, we can say that this is uh, 3 kT. We're going to cancel out the NH over 2 lambda NH. And I can plug in, so that's 3 times 1.38 times 10 to the minus 23rd joules per Kelvin times the temperature, which is, I'm taking it as 5,000 Kelvin. It's a little higher than I initially, initially stuck in there, but uh, it's still pretty flat all the way to 5,000. Yeah, okay. Now I'll plug in lambda, which I've read off the graph as 3 times 10 to the minus 37 watt meter cubed. And then I'm going to uh, multiply that by the density of the material, which is 10 to the 6 per meter cubed. Units cancel there and there, and kelvins cancel. So it's a joule over a watt. We end up with units of time. So all of the units work out really nicely. And oops, I forgot the 2 that goes right there. And if I plug all this into my handy-dandy trusty calculator, I get a value that is about 3.45 times 10 to the 11 seconds. And of course, I'm not good with seconds, so I'll convert that to years, seconds over one year. And that's about 10, 11,000 years, which is a long time, but unlike things that we've been talking about earlier, is actually a tractable amount of time. This is like relatively fast in the cosmic sense. So this is able to like cool down really quite quickly and get down uh, to these low temperatures. 
compared to star formation time scales, orbital times of sun around galaxy. All these things are really long compared to uh, the cooling time of the ISM. So that's something to keep in mind is that the ISM is moving faster through its thermal phases in heating and cooling than uh, most uh, other processes in the galaxy. And that's what we want to talk about with the ISM. Onward to galaxy evolution.